Achieve the use uh, objectives of climate mitigation and adoption and enhance uh, food security. The regulation requires uh, uh, member states to establish and implement measures to restore at least 20 percent of the EU land and sea areas by 2010. To total produce specific requirements for member states. To set out the measures to reserve the declines of the nature's population by the benefit of the nature's based on the delegated acts adopted by the Commission to establish a scientific based method for monitoring pollinator diversity and uh, populations. Member states will have to monitor uh, progress in this respect at least uh, every six years after benefit. It is enough uh, on how to this uh, achieve this question. We are very open to answer, uh, to try to answer it. Uh, and uh, we will have uh, two hour key speeches and discussion. The beginning of the two key speeches and uh, a discussion after the poll. And uh, first of all, I would like to introduce uh, our first week. Now, speaker, uh, Professor Dennis Bishop from the University of Mons in Belgium. He is the head of the laboratory of zoology, where he has developed studies to globally understand uh, biodiversity and conversation. Professor, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the introduction. Thank you very much for the presentation. So, uh, yes, I'm uh, working here in Belgium as a professor at the University of Mons, and my lab is working on wild bees. <clears throat> and now we are also developing research on other pollinators, but overall, our expertise is on uh, wild bees. So, of course, I'm going to talk a bit more here about uh, wild bees, but also a bit about uh, pollinators. So, Noah asked me to make a presentation where I will present some uh, facts behind the nature research in law. And so we're going to talk about um, we're going to talk about three points here and I'm try to not be too long. We're going to uh, talk about uh, the evidence uh, based uh, of the, um, the decline of uh, biodiversity. <laughs> and on this data that was built, the nutritional law arguments. And then, uh, what do we find in this uh, law about uh, pollinators? And um, I will finish by um, what we look for what in the future. So, how we will organize uh, data collection to test uh, the efficiency of the implementation of the action. So I'm going to talk about the, the EU bonds, which is the uh, monitoring and prevent agents. Okay, so some uh, facts to start. One of the challenge when we are talking about pollinators is, is the fact that we are talking about biodiversity. And here, when we are talking about biodiversity, we are talking about a lot of uh, species. And here on the slide, what you can see is the number of species recorded in Europe. And you have the three main uh, group of pollinators uh, with the red color <clears throat> and all the groups uh, of vertebrates or invertebrates in Europe. 
So you can see that for bees, we have more than 2,000 species, for circuits almost 1,000, and for butterfly, a bit less than 400 uh, species. So if you compare, for example, to mammals, <coughs> the, the bees, just the bees, are 10 times more diverse than, than the mammals. And of course, every species of bees is as different as the two species of birds. So when you compare mammals that you know, uh, Cat and a dog, when they have two bees, they are as different as a cat. So it means also when we implement uh, actions to conserve uh, diversity, we also have to uh, design these actions based on this diversity. Okay, so um, huge diversity in Europe, but this diversity is not uh, evenly distributed, of course. You have some regions of diversity. And I just put here the example for the bees, where you have a strong region from the north to the south, and the maximum of diversity of pollinators is in the south. You will have the same kind of the same map for the overflies or the, the butterflies. Um, we have also a lot of species that are endemic, meaning that uh, uh, they are only recorded in Europe, and so we have the responsibility of uh, conserving these species. Um, associated to this region, we have also a region of knowledge, and we talked about that uh, before. Europe is diverse in terms of history, and in terms of uh, uh, history of uh, natural sciences, and there are strong traditions uh, in North and West of Europe, where, while um, it's much less important. So, so it means that we have a lot of historical data in Western countries, while in Southern and Eastern countries we have less. So as we are in Belarus, here in the house of Belarus, you can see that this country has a lighter um, color here. But it doesn't mean that there are less bees than in Poland. It means that there are less people in Belarus, and so what do I mean? Okay. So uh, what do we know about this diversity? So we know the numbers, we know the distribution. What do we know about the population trends? So we have a tool that is named Red lists that's developed by uh, the International Bureau of Agriculture Conservation, IUCN. We have um, an assessment for the bees, an assessment for the hoverflies, and an assessment for the bees. The one of the bees was published in 2014, and uh, we will have an update on this year. What can we see in this assessment of human bees? We can see two things. First, if you consider only the species for which we have an assessment, Almost 10% of the species have been assessed as threatened, so uh, vulnerable and dangerous or critically endangered, meaning that there is a risk of extension in Europe for these species. The second point that we see in this uh, data is that there are a lot of species that have been assessed data deficient. It means that we didn't have enough data to properly assess population trends or risk of extinction for these species. So there is a huge uh, knowledge gap, and hopefully for the bees, we will reduce this uh, this uh, percentage of data deficient for the next uh, next weeks. For the two other groups of uh, pollinators, the the percentage of data deficient is much less uh, important. It's not that again that bee people are not working uh, more than certain people or uh, or butterfly people, but it's just that we have more species than. Butterfly and overflies. So, lots of work, and we are less. But anyway, this is uh, the result for the overflies that was published last year. And um, you see that the percentage of pregnant species is much higher so in this group for different reasons. I'm not going to deal with that. And then we have the, the butterfly. The last one was published in 2010. And again, we will have an update soon. And for this uh, group, we have the same similar species uh, results than for the big species. So we have around 10% of the species registered. So we have this European release that uh, have like a uh, general framework of analysis, but it's not only uh, the only information that we have uh, to evaluate uh, population trends in Europe. We have also the national release. So there are studies like this one that is published for Belgium, 
And most of the time, when you consider countries, Western countries or northern countries, the, result, the results are much worse than southern or eastern countries. So here, for example, in Belgium, while we didn't have extinct species at the European level, in Belgium, we have what we call regionally extinct, meaning that species have been recorded in Belgium that they disappeared. So we have historical record of the species and they just disappeared. <clears throat> and you can see that the percentage of the threatened species is much higher uh, than the European population. And this result for Belgium is very similar to the result for Netherlands. So this Netherlands and Belgium are the worst. And again, in the implementation of the Chubb Resolution Law, of course, there is an issue. It will be the same when you're in Romania or the media when you are in So what does it mean <clears throat> in the concrete point of view? So I will just give you like two maps here with two bumblebees. <clears throat> so these bumblebees are hairy bees. And you can see uh, a map with dots. And every dot has different color. You have green dots, yellow dots, and red dots. The red dots are the old reports, and the green dots are the recent reports. It means when you see this map, you have a lot of red dots, it means that in this area, the species was recorded in the past, but not anymore recorded. So you can clearly see for this species the construct, the construction of uh, the distribution. You have a population of the species only here, mainly in the mountains. <clears throat> Alors, not all the species are declining. Some species are declining, some species are found. And here is uh, an example of species that is this concern, so quite fine, even if the abundance is declining. So you have a lot of windows. <coughs> so what are the uh, threats? What are the causes of this uh, decline of pollinator diversity in Europe? And I will again not go too much into details because there are other sessions after uh, in this week where we have all in this in detail. But to be short again, the main threats are related to agricultural practices. This is where we have the main, the main problem. <clears throat> and um, of course, it's not the only one. You have also climate change for uh, some of the groups. So if you look at um, a, a bit more into details of uh, which groups is dec are declining and which groups are not declining. I just said before, some species are declining, some species are not. Can we find a common pattern of the species that are declining? <clears throat> so one of the, the, the things that you find, here it's a study in Netherlands, is that the, the bees that are more specialized in their own plant choices are more pregnant. In other words, when you have a bee species that has a narrow range of plants, but can collect for them of only a few plant family, it declines faster than the one that have a broad diet, able to collect for them on many plant family. So this is this was the species for the plants. And especially the, the bees, that they are specialized on the legume family and on the lambs. But the, the rare and specialized species are not the only one. We just published this paper this summer in nature, where, where we analyzed the uh, distribution of the bumblebees and we implemented some models for the future and the potential impact of climate change on the bumblebees. And what we see in this paper is that even for the very common species, we will have a decline of the range of distribution <clears throat> and uh, it might affect, of course, the pollination services that this uh, common species. So it's important to really understand that it's not only the very rare species in nature reserve that are declining. We have also very common species, very important species for the function of the ecosystem, for the pollination that are declining. So to finish this, uh, this part, we might ask like, well, okay, pollinators are declining, these are declining, but are they declining more than the other groups? In other words, how would it happen? Should we be more worried for the pollinator than for the other wild? And the answer is, is no. So here you have some um, 
some um, results from this paper published last year, <laughs> where it shows that uh, pollinators are indeed declining for Europe in terms of abundance, but not much more about richness compared to, for example, uh, the birds. And again, if you compare the red list of the European bees and European butterflies and flies to the, the red list of the birds, we are kind of the same in the red. So there are 13% of the birds that are on the red list. So pollinators are declining, but not more or less than the other groups. Of course, there are some exceptions. Shock. So, just to sum up, when we are talking about biodiversity and population trends in Europe, yes, we have a decline. 10% of these and of plants are at risk of extinction, and there are a lot of habitats also that are in poor condition and we lose. So, based on these facts, based on this evidence, um, the Ben Institution proposed. Uh, you know, for uh, restore. And here I put uh, this important uh, definition of what are we talking about uh, when we are talking about restoration. Restoration, it's an active process. It means that we, uh, land managers, we are not, uh, put some actions to assist the recovery of the system. <clears throat> it was uh, degraded that it shows not only about letting nature come back, it's also like so support um, nature. Just a few facts, uh, but to complete um, the introduction that you made for me. So um, it means that, as this law was put it, is that it will be a constraint for the member states to implement this, uh, this uh, restoration action. The goal as a Targets is the twenty percent of the land, C, and the time also two thousand thirty, twenty thirty, and we can be proud of this. Even we can always criticize this, but it's the first law actually um, focusing on the recovery of nature in the United States, and I think uh, in the world. So, uh, like it was mentioned also in the introduction. There is a special component uh, about pollinators in the law. So it's talking about nature in general and pollinators in particular. So the study of the pollinator are in the law. And this kind of uh, uh, week that uh, we have the bee week, of course, it's uh, one of the reasons why we have this. I think that scientists, association, uh, politics did a great uh, work in terms of lobbying. Uh, to put the coordinator at the top of the agenda when we are talking about the restoration law. And this is uh, this text is uh, uh, captured from the website of the so it's not even me analyzing this, it's uh, what the EU is saying. And the goal that is very ambitious is to, rest, to reverse the decline of the coordinator by 2013. Okay, so great ambition, but uh, how to do it? <coughs> and of course, um, the scientist has a, a part in that, but not only, of course, especially in the implementation action. So <clears throat> we didn't wait. I mean, when, when I say we, like it's the ecosystem, especially European Commission, didn't wait the vote of European uh, Resolution Law for Nature uh, to start the process of uh, knowing better the population trends of uh, communities. So there are already some projects, and again, we're going to talk about that more. To Next days, European projects to uh, to uh, build new capacities in terms of research, in terms of uh, um, data, to be able to monitor this European. Um, so here, just a network of the different European projects, and you're gonna have a presentation on this um, tomorrow and on that also. So basically, we have some projects that we build taxonomy trainings, collections, to be able to, uh, to monitor, let's say 2026, uh, with a standardized protocols, the pollinator and the <clears throat> And I will just finish my presentation with one example of what we can do next, what will be implemented, what can be implemented 
in this uh, resolution process. <clears throat> so I mentioned that we had um, a red base for the bees, and uh, we identified some species that are declining, and uh, some traits that are associated to this. One of the traits I said is the specialization regarding pollen. So we have this beautiful uh, species that they are pregnant because they are associated to a plant that is here, a Capricoliaceae, the genus Caviosa, that is declining. It's a grassland species. There are many threats that I will just look after. And so you have here the categories of this uh, beautiful species, what we call the Pantalumis. But they have a huge, huge head nose. <clears throat> and um, we published last year an action plan for this uh, species at uh, continental level. So, what we, um, we should do for uh, reversing the decline of this uh, is associated to uh, this. <clears throat> and of course, the main point will be um, the post plant resources. So to conserve these species, we need to conserve the plants and the habitats associated with these plants. <coughs> and, and then again, we have different strategy depending on where we are. And in the south of Europe, one of the big problems is abandonment. So farmers are not uh, cutting the grasses anymore. And then you have a reforestation happening and the plants are dying. And on the other side, <coughs> in the Western Europe, we have more problems with nitrogen or problems of, um, of water. <clears throat> so following this process of implementation, we will start next year to identify um, stakeholders and actors, land manager that might implement the action plan. <coughs> and again, here we have to be very careful when we are talking about restoration of nature. <clears throat> we should not uh, take some seeds from China to have a nice, uh, a colorful uh, um, meadow of nice flowers that are not related to the native plants, but we should really have a local, uh, local plants. So what we can do also as a scientist to uh, move forward on the restoration of pollinators, we publish this kind of uh, policy brief um, related to pesticide use and how to Increase the pressure of um, pesticides in agro ecosystems. So it's really in different ecosystems that we have to work, not only seminifer areas for these uh, beautiful scavious plants, but also in uh, agricultural areas where the diversity is really less interesting, but very important. This common diversity is very important <coughs> for the ecosystem. And you're going to talk about that also this, this afternoon. So I finish here my uh, my presentation. So in a, in a few uh, a few words, uh, yes, the pollinators are climbing <clears throat> at different uh, uh, intensity and different places. We need um, this implementation of the EU funds, so the European Monitoring uh, Scheme for pollinators <clears throat> to uh, have a proper uh, database to assess the efficiency of the action. And, uh, and, yeah, and then we have to move to work, of course, with everyone to implement with uh, land user, land manager, this uh, situation. Thank you. Thank you, Professor, for your very informative presentation. And thanks to you to us and also for your recommendation for, for the future. I know the time for the young generation, and we have the second keynote speaker is Tanya Cruz, for the coordinator of the Biodiversity Working Group at the Generation Climate Europe, the largest coalition of youth led uh, networks on environment and climate issue at the European level. Yeah, right there, the floor is yours. Um, thanks, it's a great introduction. Um, so, yes, I'm here with Fire Diversity Um, but I previously co led the team for nature restoration. So, we very closely followed the whole process of the nature restoration 
And I came at this with my background in architecture management. I guess naively thinking that a full century would bode on a little geographical nature. Um, so we were all concerned about, you know, having a very efficient law and all that it was used as a state law to have the young generation. Are the ones um, that will disproportionately suffer from the impact of climate change in their lives. But a meeting with Cesar Lena back in May showed us just how critical the whole political landscape was, how critical the situation was, and we saw in that there was absolutely no certainty that that law will get passed. Um, so I didn't see the big news. But actually, climate change and biodiversity ecosystems, I could still not really believe how the political situation was in one of your local communities very clearly. So, we shifted our whole attitude to focus from the political ambition to actually get the real path. So, we wrote a lot of articles, policy briefs, um, joined social media campaigns, um, also had collaborations with other organizations. And reaching out to any people who are still undecided and influencing science and young people to vote for such a law. All the right things, isn't it? Like, the president is messed up that we actually persuade politicians to restore nature. Um, so then the outcomes of the trials came as a bit of a relief, um, of course, and there's still like with it, but at least agricultural lands made it back into the agreement for restoration of peatlands. Um, but also, most of the other people have been really watered down. So, um, Fertilizers and pesticides. 
pesticides every year as we increasingly degrade our soils and drive pollinators into extinction. We really, really need to step away from this notion, as said David Attenborough so beautifully put, that we are the part from nature, but that we are a part of nature and that we have an essential role like all other species within this system. In Europe, for example, 39 bird species actually rely on agricultural lands and they cannot thrive in other habitats. So they have adapted to these systems, but those are not the intensively farmed lands that are drenched in pesticides and herbicides, but the genetically farmed lands that are actually in tune with nature. And these lands can also help immensely with climate change, adaptation and mitigation. So I find it so weird that the politicians around this whole nature restoration law campaign were talking about how we should focus on the climate emergency and not so much on nature and biodiversity when both are so intrinsically linked. I mean, healthy soils capture carbon, so do trees. Um, with ever warmer temperatures, trees also provide a more favorable microclimate for other plants and animals. Um, also, Hedgerows, for example, they provide shelter, they increase biodiversity, um, also hosting species that can act as natural pest control, which reduces the need for chemical pesticides, um, which do not only affect the health of ecosystems, but also of our own health, um, but also help, you know, with soil erosion, um, which happens because of winds and rains, which become more unpredictable and more severe due to climate change. So all of these things would actually increase the resilience of agricultural lands um, and therefore food security. Of course, pollinators play such an essential role in this as well. Um, impact ecosystems are just so vital and we rely on them just how much we are <laughs> about to find out as they are degrading rapidly. And young people will be the ones to suffer disproportionately from this. So young people have the highest stake in the fight against environmental threats, but can also be such a big part of the solution if adequately empowered. This is why we demand an ambitious rule that actually includes young people as important stakeholders, and with ambitious actions actually contributes to intergenerational equity. So as shown by different initiatives around the world, by organizations such as Generation Climate Europe, Young people are already part of the next generation of change makers, and we have the knowledge and the skills to work to restore ecosystems. And it is fundamental that efforts are taken to provide, for example, accessible funding for youth initiatives and allow the new generation to take leadership roles, but also be included in important decision making processes. So the Brazilian floor at the moment does not go far enough to include young people and does not respect the principle of intergenerational equity by just not being ambitious enough. And we have to drive the knowledge and the skills needed. So the, it, it seems odd that the new regulation does not mention young people at all. We demand ambitious action to be taken across the EU to ensure the implementation of an effective and equitable nature restoration law. And with its success, it can also serve as valuable inspiration worldwide in defending the rights of youth through restoring nature. Um, so we do demand ambitious action to be taken by 2030. We are, of course, mm -hmm. pleased the negotiators have not completely failed youth and EU citizens. Um, with, for example, reintroduced PFAS into the text. But the original ambitions have been severely watered down, and as said before, it's far higher from what science tells us is necessary. So the real question really is if it addresses the fundamental um, problems of the climate and biodiversity crisis. And I would say it doesn't, but given the fierce opposition, we are of course very pleased that an agreement has been reached and it is now vital that the law is adopted by the co-legislators for the elections <laughs> and implemented without delay um, to fulfill our global commitments on climate and biodiversity. So in the name of youth, but also humanity more generally, I would say, um, I call upon everyone who can vote on this law to vote in favor. 
Um, it is an important step towards a livable future. And I do have to acknowledge that this law alone won't save us, but it is an important step in the right direction. Um, considering the immense opposition, I suppose it is the best that was possible at this stage. So yeah, everyone can vote on this one. I urge you to do so, and I thank you all very much for your attention. Thank you, Daniel. We are able to be very proud of the young generation is very ambitious and support us for the nature of solution. And the no. vote. No, Thank you. Uh, uh, now, dear colleagues, I would like to invite the uh, other our panelists. Uh, first of all, my uh, colleague from the European Parliament and the European Parliament, Nicola Stefanuta from Romania, representing the Greens political group. Thank you. And uh, Neil Carlin, political director in Copa Cojeca, an organization of the farmers and cooperatives, and Sadil Liemans, police officer in the World Wide Life Fund. And uh, if you agree, maybe you introduce this short statement and then we will continue in the question and answer and discussion. Uh, Nicola? Thank you. I understand that we are microphone and that, so I will switch to the center. Uh, sorry for sitting on my back, especially for such a beautiful speech. Uh, my name is Nikolai Stepanuta. I'd like to say to, to welcome you all to this very important event to the pollinators week in general. Uh, and I would like to thank three Belarus for hosting us. Um, I want to say a few things because I listened very carefully to, to what you said. And it is indeed like that. It's politics, it's politics. You in the room might be more inclined to think it's science, more inclined to think it's agriculture, more inclined to think it's the future of a young generation. But don't underestimate the stupidity of politics sometimes. And the, I don't even know how the cynicism politics. And I will give you an example. I've been close to five years now in the European Parliament as a member, and uh, I was sitting in the Environment Committee from the beginning. I knew it was a, a moment of change, a very important moment. I'll give you two examples of this stupidity. One example is in February 2020, when I proposed an amendment in the Environment Committee to have reserves of masks and other uh, essential uh, medicine. Because I was seeing the images of Wuhan and things that were happening in China, so I was thinking it will come to us. And that amendment fell. It, it fell because half of the members ideologically said, well, we belong to the right, so reserves and stocks, uh, you know, let the market deal with it. The same amendment, one month later, March 2020, passed unanimously because already the pandemic was here. The buildings were locked, the parliament was locked. So when the members finally felt on their skin what it was, then they were convinced. Second example, in 2019, when I was elected, I was from Romania, the only member who said, the Green Deal is important and we shouldn't fight it. Because the prime minister at that time, came to us and said, you should block the Green Deal because it's a strategy of the Westerners to destroy our Eastern industry. And I, you know, my heart rate uh, got uh, up and I stood and said, no, Prime Minister, uh, it's, it's a necessity, it's a necessity of this generation and also it's an economic policy for the future. So we shouldn't block it, we should try to, uh, to profit from it, to adapt to it, Anyway, uh, I just wanted to open by this because tomorrow the environment committee will vote again on the nature restoration law. And just last week in Strasbourg, unfortunately, a pesticide uh, deal, the sustainable use of pesticides 
uh, regulation was not adopted because it was killed. It was killed uh, by, I have to say, I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not a political event, but I have to say it's from the right and extreme right. Yeah? So the right and extreme right killed the new sustainable pesticide uh, directly. Parts of, of uh, some of the, the left, the conservative left, I would say, uh, including from the country that I come from, but mostly it was a right, extreme right coalition. So when you see now, for instance, the results in the Netflix or in Romania, where I'm from, you see how, which is a part of it, is about 25%. Ask them, how do they vote on the pesticide? Ask them, how do they vote on the nature restoration? Because they are all represented already. Uh, and when they say, oh, I care about uh, small farmers, I care about beekeepers, I care about uh, local food, you know, good Romanian food, then ask them, if you care, then why did you vote against the pesticide uh, regulation? Why did you vote against the nature restoration? You know, why are you against the Green Deal? Uh, I'm one for accountability. I'm also a father. I have a daughter of three and a half years old. And I'm thinking, you know, 2050 is when she will be 30. It's not a theoretical time. It's tomorrow, basically. In 2100, when I won't be around, but hopefully she will be, it's when she's 80. So it's, it's about one generation. That's it, one generation. So uh, I'm sorry, I'm, you know, I, I will get to the point of pollinators uh, and all, uh, and all, obviously I support uh, the breakfast directive. I support uh, the beekeepers uh, and, and the possibility to have good, natural, home source, European uh, honey and, and uh, products like that to preserve our biodiversity. The goals linked to bees, linked to green cities, because that's also a huge problem. Our cities are turning less and less green. Uh, there's a, a huge backlash of just building, building, building. More concrete, more concrete, the, the air quality is being destroyed, uh, biodiversity inside cities are, is being destroyed. So it's a big fight, but it's also a big political fight. And if you think about 2024, we are six months and a few days away from elections, think about it because uh, right plus extreme right means this, means no more green deals. The, the reason why, why we, we are uh, we see these results recently in the plenary of the parliament is because there's obviously a black list of environmental policies. There's a black list. Every single environmental regulation, decision, directive is on that black list right now. So uh, there's a concerted, cooperating effort to kill environmental legislation. This is my news for the generation that's anxiously awaiting. Uh, so yeah, so what I can only say is try to help us, you know, go back, go back to your countries and say, hey, we need to be paying attention to these things because actually they have effects. They have uh, real life uh, effects. So this is the, my, my setting speech for the discussion. I'm your ally. I will always be, I constantly be, because I do it from, from profound conviction and, and from a vision for the future thinking how I would like Europe to be in five to ten years. But not everyone thinks about you know, five or ten years. Most politicians think about today. And with environmental issues, it might feel like when you speak about the disease. It might feel like there's a cancer looming in, at some point, but the cigarette of today is a cigarette of today, regardless of the cancer of tomorrow. So we should shift our mentality a bit and try to think more, more, more long term. And you guys should apply pressure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nicolai. I agree with the majority of what you said, but it's difficult, I think, for, for, for us how to manage or how to convince our citizens to, to follow what we do say, because the France Timmermans is the flagship of, of the Green Deal, and the citizens in Interman, they vote differently. 
This is the program. How we should explain for our citizens what, what about we to talk. But it's uh, for the future our discussion. Now I would like to ask the police director and Papa Gosha to start. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Yeah, very good. My name is Niall Curley. I'm from Co Project here from Farmers and Agriculturists. I think uh, you all for inviting me here and for the hosting in this uh, lovely building. You've actually given me a uh, promotion and only a senior policy advisor, not director. I'd like to send that back to my, my boss that, that I get that promotion. Um, thank you. Um, on this, I was the main person for uh, nature restoration for Coco Projecta. I was a part of this so called fake news campaign, apparently. Um, I, I like that word, so those two words put together. They're, it's very Trump esque to be called uh, fake news, but in this, it's, it's interesting. We had very two, two, three main issues with the nature restoration law. It's called realism. Uh, we had an issue with non fulfillment, we had an issue with non deterioration, and we had an issue mainly with financing. Uh, I think everyone in this room knows that there is not enough money being put into biodiversity, that there is not enough money being put into biodiversity within agriculture. And yet here we are with a final text that still does not actually address anything to do with financing. It talks about funding gaps, it talks about addressing these funding gaps, it talks about getting to these funding gaps and seeing what's important. And then potentially in 2027, maybe bringing in a nature restoration fund. I think everyone in this room agrees that we need a nature restoration fund. And yet this, in this final text, is uh, something that we've called for as a project of European farmers. And I think uh, any environment NGO discussing on this topic said we need a nature restoration fund. This is the fundamental of how you improve uh, nature on agricultural land, on forestry land, on peatlands. I'm from a peatland farm myself. I was going to convince my father and my neighbours to, to go into an agri EIP scheme for rewriting peatland. Talking about nature and talking about biodiversity is talking about ensuring that the resources get people on the ground. If you look at the current uh, CAP and the uh, agro eco schemes and how they're implemented, there are only four countries that actually have pollinator specific agro eco schemes in them Lithuania, Spain, Estonia, and Croatia. Four. And we're talking about how we're going to implement the nature restoration uh, law without the proper financing. Everyone talks about how we're going to, we were able to change the uh, cap strategic plans every year if you want. We're not going to do that, guys. It took at least three years to get this current CAP going, and we're talking about another three years to get those plans going. We're changing the cap in four years. And you want member states to try and change their plans to incorporate further restoration measures. And the current CAP is on individual land managers, the land owner, land powers in specific, not landscape. We're not talking about landscape restoration here, we're talking about land persons. So if your neighbor doesn't go into the specific scheme that you go into, well, you might as well be throwing money into the wind. So what we have here is a law that's sufficient. If that is why we wanted to change. When throughout this campaign we're talking about yes to nature restoration, no to this law because it's deficient. It doesn't give the people who are going to implement the law the right resources to do it. The tools, the people on the ground that are going to implement it, they are not there. And so that's why we call for a, a stopping to this law, to get us a different law, a law that actually did the work, that actually did nature restoration. I get to pollinators as well, you know, I have to get in there as well. As I said, the four topics, it's four countries that actually have them with now. That is what this law is going to be um, putting in place currently. When you're writing your plan, it will take three years between 2027 and 2030 for member states to now implement pollinator specific targets to get to reverse the trend. That is the law that we've received. Thank you very much. That is what we have. That is all we've been looking for. A realistic, pragmatic law that gave the resources to people to ensure the pollinator trend reversal could be achieved. But this is not there. This is the same for any other specific uh, type of uh, grasslands, 
as the, I'm actually going to ask you for your presentation later, because this is exactly what you need. This is a presentation that should be given to every community group, every farming community, every local community, when you're talking about ground up co-design of nature restoration products to show them, farmers, land managers, those on the ground who know what they need to do with their land and they explain fully what needs to be done for specific habitats for specific species. It's down to grassland species that needs to, and can be actually encouraged within specific farms and specific regions to get us towards the nature restoration goals. But without that, without actually being able to bring that to the people on the ground, we will not have a nature restoration type of campaign. And that's not because of a fake news campaign. It's, it's about being able to get the money on the ground to enable restoration. And we do not have that. I'm not ask you to, 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 to vote it down. Not. Because this is what we have. We need nature restoration. But what the law that has been brought forward right now is a shambles. And that is not the fault of the farmers, that's not the fault of the lobbying by the farmers. It's the fault of being unable to actually get our voices heard uh, on, by the correct people who actually want to enable change. And that's what we have here. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. The first one we hear that we all for nature restoration, that, that we need the uh, resources. And we need a, need a practical implementation. And now I would like to ask Sabine uh, Rivers to take the floor. Thank you very much for the kind uh, invitation. Uh, my name is Sabine Rivers. I work for the WWF European Policy Office here in Brussels. And uh, I was also following the negotiations on the nature restoration very closely. And I would like to say, uh, but to start by saying that actually this law is quite historic because it's the first time um, that we will have uh, legislation in place, if all goes well, that sets legally binding targets not to preserve nature, which is really important, but given uh, the losses that we are witnessing, preserving nature is not sufficient. We need to bring nature back. And this is very important for nature itself and for its intrinsic value, but not only for that. And of course, pollination is one of the key examples why it is in our benefit to restore nature and why it's so urgently needed. And it was already mentioned that during the negotiations, because of the fierce opposition that we have actually not witnessed um, um, for other files, it was really very, very harsh opposition against this uh, proposal. Uh, the political agreement that has been found uh, earlier this month has been watered down significantly. And I am looking forward uh, to um, advocate together with Popa Kocheka in the discussions on the next multiannual framework for more funding and for dedicated funding for nature, and I'm really looking forward to that. But of course, uh, the opposition against the nature restoration law was not um, objective. It was not about how can we improve it and make it help better. It was about rejecting the nature restoration law. It was about deleting everything in relation to a restoration in agricultural ecosystems. But we have now a political agreement, and although it is not perfect, it's the only thing we have, and we need to get it through now. And why is this also important for pollinators? First of all, and it was mentioned already, we, we have the, the biodiversity strategy had already the target of reversing by 2030 the pollinator decline. But we know that these kinds of political commitments, these kind of voluntary commitments, are not really working because, in the end, the implementation is not there. So, the nature restoration law is putting this political commitment and it's changing it into a legally binding commitment. And that is really important. And of course, the, the legally binding commitment is for the member states, it's the member states that need to implement the targets in the nature restoration law. 
and they will have uh, two years to draft national restoration plans that we very much uh, want them to be um, uh, done in participation with all the stakeholders, including farming community, including youth organizations, including environmental organizations, all stakeholders should be involved and it's there that the concrete uh, decisions are going to be taken, where to restore, how to restore. So this is not um, uh, proposed by uh, Brussels top down, this will be discussed at the national level. Um, last week, the member states already um, um, endorsed the political agreement, so they gave a very important signal that they are ready to start implementing this law. So, of course, we ask the parliament now to do the same. And um, I was also very surprised, and it is actually very cynical to see that on the one hand, the parliament is adopting with a lot of bombardi the um, a kind of uh, non-binding resolution on the revised pollinator initiative, which is of course very important. But on the other hand, voting down uh, the regulation on the sustainable use of pesticides, while we all know that it is one of the main drivers of pollinator decline. So if the parliament wants to be a true and credible champion for pollinators, they need to vote for the nature restoration law. And the first step for that is tomorrow in the environment committee. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for your position. We have some uh, recommendation or input for the members of European Parliament, but if you have plans from the colleagues from the Envy Committee, we will see tomorrow and then in the, in the plenary. But now is the time for the, and also I would like to underline the importance of discussion and uh, involvement of us, you all those that all this in the member states. We need, we need to discuss, we need to involve the, all, all stakeholders in this situation and uh, achieve the, the common understanding and agreement. Now it's time for the question and comments. Please indicate, raise your hands and to be possible just to ask the question for the panelists or maybe you. Please. Hello, I have a technical question from our first speaker. Uh, what is the role or how important the role do the various European subspecies of Atlas mellifera play in the pollinization? We talked about wild bees. Do you include them? The subspecies of Atlas mellifera in your wild bees. So the, the studies of bees is a bit complex. So following, for example, IUCN criteria, it's considered as domesticated species. Why is the subspecies considered? Because it's managed and you um, you, uh, you control the reproduction and there are some selections. So based on this. Um, Honeybee, Western honeybee is not considered as one. We can have wild colonies, feral colonies, but we don't know much about uh, the dynamic between the domesticated uh, uh, captive population and the uh, hives. So uh, that's why when we, we do the, the assess, we did the assessment for the red list. Um, the only bees was assessed as data deficient because we don't have good knowledge about the white population and the dynamic the population trends of this one population. But in terms of uh, pollination, honeybees is by far the main pollinators of crops and also of many white plants. So for, for this importance, we really need to make the distinction between white plants and domesticated plants. For many, many crops, honeybees is to 90, 95 uh, flower visits. Um, in terms of efficiency, it's not necessarily the most efficient. And uh, it's an improved by many papers that uh, the more you have a species, the best is the pollination. So we cannot move to a system where you have only the honeybees. It could be very, very poorly resilient. We, 
might we we have we should be able to have to have the white species associated to the honeybees for the for the pollination. So and regarding the the variation in terms of subspecies, every subspecies has this local adaptation that we selected uh, regarding climate or regarding landscape. So it's also important to prepare this uh, diversity, intraspecific diversity of the honeybees in the, the same way it's important to conserve diversity in the varieties of crops. So diversity here, even if it's not wide, it's important to keep it. And of course, there are some uh, laws or actions uh, that need to be implemented specifically for the honeybees because it's domestically. For example, for the markets, not import uh, colonies from other countries or from other continents. One of the consequences of this international market was we had the Varroa, the parasite that was imported from Asia. So this species uh, deserves like a proper um, proper management in terms of uh, those species. Okay. okay, thank you. What else? Oh, please. Uh, thank you very much for the interesting presentations. Um, so I would like to ask as a concerned citizen, what can I do to support uh, the nature restoration laws? Do you I would like to, before I answer that question, to briefly say something about what uh, our dear colleague from Popa Kojeka said. Uh, Especially because I was budget rapporteur for 2023 for the ongoing year. So when we negotiated the budget in the beginning, the, I don't think it's, but maybe you hear me now. When we negotiated the budget, the commission said we should have 7% for biodiversity for, from the year 2024 and 10% from 26, 27, which is not completely accurate. That there is lacking budget. Seven percent of one trillion is not little. Uh, if, and if you add all the all the other schemes under the common agricultural policy that are linked to the biodiversity, uh, I would say that the argument is not actually completely accurate. Yeah. Secondly, uh, what can we do on nature restoration? Put more pressure. The reason why we had a major restoration in the first place is that the NGO started to write to members and to politicians, to be honest. But it was so tight in 2015, as you know, it was 50 50, 44 to 44 at the end of that. And then in my case, associations from academia wrote to MEPs that did have an intention to vote for the nature restoration law. And finally, we had 11 MEPs or something like that, which is very rare. Uh, or a conservative country like that, to have 11 MPs vote for or something. But it was only with the public pressure. Only with the public pressure. Without it, we would have lost. So I don't have any solution. Thank you. Be visible, uh, do the name calling, do your MEP. Public pressure. We need you as much as you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Ingrid Schmanz and I'm representing the Austrian beekeeper, beekeepers, beekeeping associations. And um, I just wanted to say I'm not a politician and uh, I'm, I'm a worker and I know uh, what's going on and working with bees, working in nation. And um, I'm sorry, I, I don't know all the things about the, the politician, politician things, but um, I, I can't uh, follow your arguments, sorry, because um, I, I think you say it's, uh, there is no money for the national restoration law. And um, I see the situation, and if we don't have the money, and if we, we don't do uh, 
do nothing and uh, the law is going to the bin, um, we, we would need more money in future because uh, then there is no need to do them. It's too late. We see, we see the situation and uh, it's very difficult for us. And uh, I think the future for us is, uh, is awful for beekeepers. And we need to have the money for doing this. That's, uh, I can follow the argument. No money, it's, it's important to have this money to do something because otherwise it's too late. There's no need for this money in, in the future. My argument isn't that just because we don't have money, we shouldn't do it. Our point was, we need to send it back so that they give the money. With regard to the budget for the EU, yes, they have set out um, a target for 7% and then increased to 10% over a series of years. We speak to the Commission right now, there was a presentation about two weeks ago by the Commission that said that member states are failing in that. Um, they're actually not going to reach their 10 and 5% uh, by 2030 projections um, because they're not putting the money into it. The money that we're talking about for the 10 billion and then the half, uh, 1.5 billion, et cetera, et cetera, this is about all the funds put together. I'm talking about the money being given to farmers, to land managers, to beekeepers. People are going to be implementing biodiversity on the ground to actually manage biodiversity. What the commission were talking about with this proposal was actually giving money to the solidarity fund for training. That is not giving money to beekeepers or land managers to ensure that the cover strips, the flower strips, that a network of beekeepers and farmers come together and talk about where they can actually work because this makes food pollinators. This is not money that's going to the space agency, which was uh, demarcated by the commission um, in their proposal. This is about talking about money going into farmers, not into their pockets and then going to the, the shop and buying the food. It's about actually being able to put in the measures to actually be able to improve biodiversity. The money isn't there, it's not being implemented, and it's not going to be there in this proposal. That is what we're talking about. We've asked repeatedly for nature restoration fund, and the budget is not being put in place. That is the clear put and drive. I completely agree that money needs to be given to people. This is about this. I'm not saying that we should scrap the law entirely because money is there. It's about making sure that the money is there. We need biodiversity. Biodiversity is what keeps my sector going. It's what keeps my father's farm home going. But it's about making sure that the money is there, the money is not. And so that's what we're talking about. It's talking about putting money in the pockets of the land managers and the beekeepers and people, the citizens. Because it's just as much about citizens being able to talk to local man managers and ensuring that. And it's not just about farmers, it's about forest owners. The biodiversity beekeepers are important as well. About all kinds of biodiversity. It's about making sure the money is there. And that's it. Okay, please take the question. And we have one question from the. What's the question? You're the leader of the Wiki Association. Um, we see that the Conservatives always neglect. Uh, Progressive in this field. Maybe we speak to the people. We speak amongst us. We know, we understand the necessity. But maybe we have to, uh, to develop a concept to speak to, to the policy units, to the conservatives. Because they block the decisions. And we have to, uh, to block their majority in a way. And to convince them uh, that this is also in their interest. To support, uh, example, so or whatever. And um, I, I, I think how we can do it. Because um, if we don't uh, have a majority, also at least some conservative uh, power bodies, um, we will fail also in future.
and you go your, your measure or your position. But I think it's also very important to have the good contact between the beekeepers organization and farmers organization inside the member states. I think we need additional dialogue because we have a very good farmers, a very progressive one, supportive for nature restoration, and all, but also we have the others who are in different positions. And also we should object that they agree that they have different challenges. For example, in my country, Lithuania, despite the election that, that we have this scheme, we uh, have the uh, lower di direct payment from the European Union than ever. When, when we joined the European Union in our uh, agreement, like Romania also, other Baltic countries must mention that we reached from 2004 till 2013 the average of uh, direct payment or external economy. But still, we didn't reach the spread of in 2013. And usually, the, the, our partners are good. You introduce new requirements for agriculture sector, but you not support financial. And this is the question for this maybe some kind of a problem. I think we need to establish the better uh, discussion, better understanding, maybe through the COPA project or directly in our member states, in our conversation and our dialogue between the agriculturists and farmers. It's very important. Because okay, we have a lot of space to, to improve the, the, the situation. And now I'd like to, please, can you? Yes, so I'm going to read a question from the audience. Uh, online and for the nature restoration law was agreed on with uh, a provision of restoration for bee population. I learned we have over 2,000 wild bee species. Do we know how healthy populations of all these species look like and how to restore all of them? Sounds very challenging as a legal target. Professor, maybe. Yes, so uh, first, as a scientist, we have a part of the information. I totally agree on what you said. It's really about uh, society, human politics, association to find together uh, solutions. I don't believe in a society where the scientists, uh, in a top down way, will impose any way in the different solutions. So there is no, I think, one way. There are many ways uh, from the politics, from the citizen, from the teacher, from the government. And uh, it won't work if we don't commit to people to, to change the practices. So regarding the, the assessment of, of the health, uh, so we are not there yet. There are some um, good data on the home bees, of course, because the beekeepers, they collect a lot of bees. So there are new tools that have been developed in terms of uh, sub-data um, uh, data, for example. Um, so indeed, it doesn't mean that uh, when the bee is not dying, it doesn't mean that she's healthy. <laughs> but we have a very few information about that. Um, and uh, we have a few models, the honey bees, we have also the bumblebees, bees, the mussel bees. But I think that the goal is not overall uh, to have, uh, let's say, scientists behind every white bees, white species to know if it's uh, uh, being well. Um, there, there is also common sense, and um, the common sense is that when you have an ecosystem that has uh, less toxins, uh, less chemical toxins, that is uh, no uh, heat waves or drought, uh, you will have uh, the full uh, species that will uh, uh, improve their health over time. So, honeybees have some specificity, but overall, if you have good food for honeybees, and uh, not too much uh, chemical stress, it's also good for the animals. So we can say that uh, if there are some species that are doing well in some habitats, it can imply that uh, the other species should be good. Thank you. 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 Hello, my name is Noah Simon, and I'm a freelance and coordinating this, I didn't want to leave you. <laughs> um, I just, uh, I wanted to ask one thing because we 
I, I feel a little bit frustrated. Um, in the latest, uh, and it's referring to the money, to the availability of money for the harvest, uh, in the latest CAP uh, report, let's say, environmental NGOs have been fighting, fighting for farmers to have increasing amount of money for good things, for nature restoration, for good applications, for eco scheme that makes sense, uh, not for any <laughs> eco scheme, but making the eco scheme that makes sense. Um, and we somehow, because it came from the environmental NGOs, the farmer didn't like it, but we were really asking for a lot of money for the farmers to really be incentivized for all these changes. And now I feel very frustrated because in this nature restoration law that I feel, because I'm also in the field and I see the, the need for this law, uh, that the farmers go against it because they don't have to, because it doesn't include the money for that. This law does not include any money. Like the, the, the money uh, always comes from other tools. Okay. So for me, sincerely, I have it very difficult to find the coherence in the positioning of the farmers. And working beekeepers, farmers, naturalist farmers is something that we have been fighting for. So we were asking for an eco scheme of pollinators in which the farmers were incentivized whenever they work together with beekeepers and with naturalists. And the naturalists and the beekeepers were also incentivized to work with the farmers. We didn't convince the, the member states, that was unfortunate, but well, that was it. So, but I, I really feel every time that I discuss <laughs> with the farmers organization, a, a great frustration because I mean, it is, it is something that when you come from the field, something needs to be done, and it's urgent. The people who have the tools to do it, or who could do it, let's say, they are not convinced that they have to do it, or they are not incentivized. And we are in a, in a circle of that is not virtuous, it's, it's vicious. So I would really, really appreciate if in a positive way, the farmers would come and, and really <laughs> construct and not be against it, not, not see nature as a constraint, but really work with it. Um, like some years ago, actually when it was the COVID, we were all very concerned about the health. Health was first. Helping our colleagues, uh, colleague partners in the surroundings, that was what we need to be done for a good society, for a healthy society. And then all of a sudden, all this is forgotten. And now we go back into, we are into a situation of war and we need to produce no matter how. And sincerely, I think we need to stop this, this way. I mean, we absolutely must reverse the situation of biodiversity that we have in the field. And we, take, we need to take the challenge. And there is no way, I mean, otherwise it's going against the wall. So I would really, really appreciate to work constructively and to be open to that, of course, the farmers need to be paid for this 100%. But not to come with a no <laughs> from the beginning. Like for me, this is really, and it's even not, not even giving a good, a good image for the farmers. I think it, it's, so, you know, like, how much trust as a consumer and as the person that lives in the countryside do I have in my neighbor? You know, but who, who is against working with nature, who is against having a sustainable use of pesticides. Who, I mean, I personally, I lose trust, trust with that. I think it is important also for the farmers to, to understand the image that they have vis-a-vis -vis their, their, their neighbors and their consumers. And we, I mean, we certainly, we are going to keep on continuing constructively working with the farmers, but, but we really need a little bit of openness. Uh, because otherwise, uh, yeah, like from the beekeeper's point of view, we always go and, and try to be constructive, uh, but we are minor. Yeah, like we are not important. As economic sector, we are minor. And, uh, and I think it's a matter of respect. So we respect the tools 
the working tools of the farmers, and the farmers need to respect our working tools. And the thing is that our working tools now, they are being killed. And this is unsustainable. So it needs to be kind of a, of a one-to-one -one equal relationship. Otherwise, it's never going to go to go in. Just a quick one. Um, yeah, just I think you're talking about three different levels here. You're talking about the EU, you're talking about member states, and you're talking about the ground level. And in some countries where it is not just the, the member state, but it's the regional government, how these eco schemes are being uh, now the eco schemes. For, sorry, first of all, nature restoration law. We've all I've always said and spoke to Jeff. We've always said that it should have been founded on community. The CAP is there for three reasons: for social, environmental, and economic sustainability of the rural areas. These all need to be held together at the same time. You're talking about biodiversity and nature restoration. This needs to be done with fresh muddy soil. It cannot uh, be a counterintuitive to the other two. That is why we've been asking for this. When you're talking about building the ecosystem, unfortunately, I am very good, I think, at my job, but I can't write ecosystems for each member state. That is not what we're doing. That is not my job. That is not the job of Cope Project. That is not the job even of the, the member organizations of Cope Project on the national level. That is up to the member states. And I know, unfortunately, we weren't able perhaps to convince them uh, to write ecosystems on this. Of course, this is not up to my position on this. When it comes down to how we actually um, ensure restoration of pollinator populations, it is about talking to the farmers. It is about talking to them and trying to set up perhaps a network, trying to talk to them and see how you can work better together. It's not just seeing your neighbor and saying, oh, well, they didn't go into the ecosystem or they didn't do this or do that. I had to convince neighbors as well to try and go into the ecosystems at home with a new system because the only way of application is two months ago. I had to try and convince them because how they cost more money for them to implement than they get back. Okay, now see how that makes sense. Cost more to implement and buy the provisions for them the ecosystems than they get back from the CAP. And then you wonder why farmers are not doing the implementation. It's because it doesn't pay them to work. It's work hours, it's costing them money, and farmers are not all millionaires. They're not doing this because it's effort or because they don't want to do it. Most farmers are making, in my own, 53% of farmers in Ireland make less than 20,000 a year. 20,000 a year. And you're wondering then why they're not putting in efforts that cost them more money. So when I talk about trying to improve through agricultural land, through forestry land, the money isn't being implemented. It is not up to the European farmers, it's not up to the member state farmers, it's up to the member states and how they write the laws. It's how they implement the money, and that is it. So that is why we've been consistently looking for new money to ensure that when it comes down to nature restoration, that money is there to point to it, implement it. Point to it, implement. There's no taking from 20 funds to ensure that nature restoration takes place. It's about literally one pot and spreading the money. And that is unfortunately what we did not do. Thank you, Thank you. We have three minutes for the last question. We have two minutes. Okay. Half minutes and half minutes for you. Okay. Go no. Okay, um, I accept completely what Mr. Curley says about how the EU wants to allow for those sort of schemes. There are some things, however, that could be done at a European level. For example, a ban on importation of those schemes from outside, which have already brought the lower heights, um, about to get a uh, high from Tuscany there, um, uh, and also to give air access on its way. Um, surely, help the EU to protect. Existing populations at a European level, something we can't do on the ground. But maybe we think that the second one on the 
Yes, um, it's more like a statement than a question because uh, protecting nature means also um, to fight against invasive species. And this is uh, something that's not really taken care of in the EU. Um, we have the list of invasive species of genuine concern, but we are very concerned about West Virginia, the Asian one. And we see on the national level in the member states that there is hardly anything done. And it's a threat to agriculture, but it's also a big threat to the environment. That's what we think at least. So science evidence is unfortunately lacking. So I would like to ask the scientists to uh, put efforts to do research there and uh, the politicians, the member states to really take action against mm -hmm. invasive species in general and here especially against the uh, West Bank. Thank you. Uh, dear my name is Lars Heyman, and uh, I am uh, president of the US. And uh, the background to uh, the organic farming is the benefits of the uh, the fighting the pesticides for you. And the work we've done to restore the environment, and there are also the groups that are working in Sweden. The national level, they're going the other way. I can't get support now for my work in organic farming because I don't have uh, very much animals. <laughs> and uh, this is a problem because if you leave it to the national level, as you uh, we can't do anything if we don't have the help from the top. This is the job. The scientists say one thing, and uh, the EU Parliament says something else. And this is the problem, because we know that we need to, we know what to do, but we can't get any help. I don't get anything from the, for the organic farming, I can't get it for the, the feeds if I don't grow chemicals. This is the problem that I see, and I've seen many years, very active, that the chemical industry has a great influence in the farms. And they work together, and they have an influence of the right way. So my problem is that we need help, and we need help from the top. That's you. <laughs> no, but, but uh, if we don't, Get people in this member or also in the European Union Parliament. We can't work when it goes down. I feel it's a bit too late. Yesterday I was at the Parliament and talked to another man, and um, he said that now yeah, we're going to work on a new tax. That has to be something else. And it comes later. But we need the resources. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your intervention. Now I would like to ask the professor and then the representative of our younger generation to summarize. Then Nicola and then I. And <laughs> okay, please, please. Yes, so I think that uh, we have to continue to work. Okay, like we need top decision, we need leaders, we need people that they look ahead, but we also need people that we implement. The action. So if you don't have the one in PC, you don't do it again. So it's really, we don't have to say, okay, if you have that, it's going to be okay. We need both. We get it from the two sides, from the bottom up and the top down, then we will uh, we have the change. Regarding the invasive species, indeed, so it's, it's again, it's a, a, a global point. Uh, we need uh, strong legislation to avoid uh, this. Uh, Markets where uh, you have invasive species arriving, and we need also strong um, uh, protection at the border and around the airports and around the, <clears throat> the places where the goods arrive. So for that, again, we need money to uh, to to be sure that to intervene very quickly because when it's there, like it's the case for uh, the Spanish Latina, 
it's very complicated after, so you would like to go out. The uh, species always the same. Strong and uh, direct and quick intervention is what is going to happen. And then as a scientist, I agree with you, we also need to, to provide tools, to develop tools to the practitioners. And for Vespa Benitina, we need to develop a very specific uh, uh, traps, and not having like this uh, basic trap where you could actually kill more like all the wasps than the opportunities in the Vespa Benitina. But for that, uh, also we need funding. I'm not research, and I'm not developing research on the species, but I think, yes, that uh, we will have sooner or later this, um, this system to, to support the, the big people for this particular because it's a very strong, uh, very strong invasive species. And uh, we have no idea if it will come from the wild or from actual invasive species. So interesting um, to hear these different perspectives today. So I'm really grateful for that. And of course, I agree there is in general not enough funding for medical ethnicity. Um, but just because the law is sufficient, I have to look at it and think that we're not happy with it is the best we've got, and it is really important to implement that. It is really important that it is formally adopted, and then of course we're looking at national restoration plans. So of course there's a lot of room for the member states to hopefully be more ambitious. We do have hope for perhaps a few little courses be more ambitious. Um, and also to include everyone in the fight we think it's really important to have this participatory approach where every stakeholder is taking into account the part they're taking into account the needs from all these different groups um, and to make the national restoration plan as efficient as possible, um, but also to have them in a way that they can be implemented and that would keep them funding the system um, and of course engage the young people on the ground. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. To say that I have not seen more divisive problems than the use of pesticide than in recent years. And member states cannot only represent one side of the story. For instance, in our case, the Minister of Agriculture cannot only request for derogations for use of human equipment, which is only one side of the story, and let the entire human population be affected by that. That is taking sides. As far as I know, national governments must represent national interests, not particular private interests. So I further want to say that uh, I see change. So we speak as if Copa Projecta represents all farmers. Uh, in the country I know best, there's a small farmer organization called the Four Valleys. There's no office from the, the tribe of the beekeepers. They are part of what we call a Let Me Hand Pick the Tour of the Continent, too. You know? uh, and there's other ones as well, not just farmers in the rural environment, there's other uh, stakeholders as well. So I have seen that opinions have shifted because farmers start to see climate change in action. In Gorsh, which is a southern Southern county in Romania, we have lost uh, one quarter, no, one third of arable land since 1990 now to climate change. In uh, uh, Borgorja, which is the historic region, we lost about 20% to desertification. So, as we see climate change, we see more and more farmers being mindful that this is happening, climate change is happening. So, can we all join the same family? It's just a matter of time. So I encourage to have these discussions, and I encourage national governments to <laughs> just one side. Thank you. Thank you. For the last, last two. But on the better second. Thank you. Because it's important for me um, 
I just want to say um, we. I, I don't want to say anything against uh, the copper because uh, the copper is very important for us, and uh, uh, we need the farmers, and the farmers need the beekeepers. But uh, it's very often um, very hard to to understand um, the treatment of the crops, and we know um, or. I think it's not possible to work without treatment, but um, how to manage the treatment, uh, it's very important for beekeepers to understand it and uh, for the farmers to understand the beekeepers and to work together uh, how to manage this, uh, these things. And, and therefore, um, my target is in Austria to, to improve the, the working um, Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, indeed, uh, dear colleagues. Uh, thank you, uh, everyone, for participating here in this uh, uh, meeting. I would like to summarize what we criticized, but he, he said that nature restoration is important <coughs> and needed for all of us. We keep us farmers, citizens, oldest, and youngest. We need the nature restoration. That's one. The second, we also need the resources for them. And it was mentioned that the, the farm, the, the different possibility, we need the resources for the fermentation or for this very important issue and that we should fight, should do, argue that we need the resources for them and try to, to become more supporters in, in this our activity. Of course, we need maybe stronger cooperation between generations. We uh, just adopted the European Parliament the uh, new generation law for for recommendations as we were for for the farmers. We need a new generation in the, in the sector and we need new ideas, the new possibilities, the new vision and implementation. We also need to better cooperation between different stakeholders. I think it's, it's really very important to have a better uh, cooperation. Scientists, they inform us what is the situation. The farmers, the beekeepers, we all need to have a more a common uh, approach. And we need for that uh, the discussion between our, ourselves how we can improve. For example, we will have, have, have the next uh, discussion about uh, new genomic uh, editing techniques. We, some of us opposed, some of us supported. We need to improve more common understanding and discussion how we can improve how we can improve the treatment with our chemicals, how we can have the strongest seeds for for the, the crops. This is the, the everywhere we need to have better communication and understanding. I also would like to send the COPA, the supporters of the world in the uh, honey bill, support new labeling, new information, uh, new safe for, for, for our the European country strong our part, stronger, stronger part in this. I think this is our common dialogue. And uh, for that reason, I would like to say we like organization also. And I think that we need a coordinator we, uh, here in the European in the Parliament, the good platform for our uh, discussion possibility to share our views of the Reach the, the, the common common understanding. Thank you, everyone, and I would like to meet you in the next uh, events in this coordinator.
Here. Yeah. Let's so let's make a test. Sorry. This is a test. Yeah, yeah, but I, I need to open the yeah, yeah, yeah. Open the door to the basement. So then you hear me very well. I'm reading your last mail because I have to have something to say. <laughs> <laughs> 